This episode contains descriptions of violence that some listeners may find upsetting. Please use discretion. Episode 2. Some Party. On the night of Saturday, November 19, 1960, Norman Mailer and his wife Adele put their two daughters to bed, Danielle, age three, and Elizabeth, age one. Then the couple prepared to host a party in their apartment on Manhattan's Central Park West. The occasion for the party was twofold. One, to celebrate the 50th birthday of a friend of Norman Mailer's, a boxer named Roger Donahue, whose professional bona fides included encounters with fame, Donahue taught Marlon Brando how to box for the movie On the Waterfront, as well as encounters with infamy. In 1951, at Madison Square Garden, Donahue fought a 20-year-old named George Flores, who died after Donahue knocked him unconscious in the eighth round. The primary purpose of the party, however, was for Norman Mailer to announce, informally, that he planned to run for the office of mayor of New York City. This was not a stunt. It wasn't a joke. Not to Mailer, anyway. At age 37, Mailer was serious about running for mayor, even though he had no staff, no central office, no political base, and absolutely no experience in holding elected office. What Mailer had were ideas, or perhaps better to say notions, of what he might do as mayor and how he'd get elected. According to biographer Mary Dearborn, Mailer planned to kick off his mayoral bid by reading an open letter he'd written to Fidel Castro, who had just risen to power in Cuba. Mailer's letter praised Castro and his revolution. What any of that had to do with the day-to-day -day concerns of the good people of New York City was anyone's guess. Mailer also believed, reportedly, that he could win the election by securing the support of the disenfranchised people of New York City, the working poor, social outcasts, junkies, and prostitutes, and people who didn't usually vote. How would Mailer get their support? By having them come to his party, to see that their candidate could also command the presence of prominent figures in politics and in public life. Mailer would then build a coalition comprising political and cultural VIPs and societies disempowered and disenfranchised. In short, Mailer imagined a base of support that reflected how he saw himself. On one hand, an intellectual and person of consequence, and on the other, a street-smart cultural outlaw. What never seemed to occur to Norman Mailer was that he was neither. Or maybe on some level it did. The fact that Mailer's party was both a birthday party and a political event could be seen as a lack of confidence on his part, or perhaps total ignorance as to how people go about running for office. Mailer was undeterred. On that Saturday afternoon of his party, Mailer phoned his friend George Plimpton, the editor of the literary magazine The Paris Review. Mailer urged Plimpton to get members of what Mailer called the power structure to come to his party, everyone from the city police and the fire commissioner to David Rockefeller and the Aga Khan. As for the proletariat, well, Mailer could just go out into the streets of New York City and pull them in. The result, as all of Mailer's biographers describe, was an incongruous melee of a party with literary guests, poets, people from publishing, standing cheek by jowl with street people hoping to get free food or drink. When George Plimpton arrived at the Mailer's, unaccompanied by the power structure, Mailer met him outside, and taking a rolled-up newspaper, Mailer struck his friend across the face, as if punishing one of his own dogs. 
Biographer Hilary Mills writes, As the party wore on and the drinking got heavier, an undercurrent of violence began to develop. Biographer Carl Rawlison writes, The atmosphere turned violent, as if no one was responsible for a general feeling that somehow arose organically. Reportedly, there were arguments at the party, minor skirmishes, people fighting to get in against people fighting to get out. Hillary Mills estimates that the number of guests, people who stayed, or who stayed only briefly, ran into the hundreds. Within the party, Mailer was hardly the model of a candidate for office, or even a congenial host. According to the various biographical accounts, Mailer challenged Roger Donahue to box, a fight that Mailer would have lost, and he challenged Random House editor Jason Epstein to box. Mailer was acting belligerent, confrontational, and antagonistic. The week prior, Mailer had been denied credit at the Manhattan Jazz Club, Birdland. This was a different time in America, when credit cards were not as ubiquitous as they are today. It was against the law in 1960 to pay for alcohol using a credit card. Mailer was arrested and charged with disorderly conduct. At the party on November 19th, Mailer had a newspaper clipping of his arrest, and he dared some of his guests to try to snatch it away from him. If that sounds bizarre, it is. Biographer Hilary Mills describes Mailer as drunken. Carl Rollison says Mailer was very, very drunk. And Mary Dearborn writes that Mailer was smoking pot daily and drinking very heavily. Now, without a toxicology report, it's impossible to say for certain what Mailer was under the influence of that night. Alcohol tends to act as a depressant, and marijuana tends to pacify and relax its users. But not everyone reacts the same way to mood-altering substances. Marijuana can also make the user paranoid. And if that same user, after several alcoholic drinks, becomes boisterous or even combative, then mixing the two is a recipe for disaster. Biographer Hilary Mills writes about a trip to Mexico that Norman and Adele made after they were married. At that time, Mills writes, Mailer was smoking marijuana aggressively, and Adele warned a mutual friend in Mexico as they all visited a burlesque house, watch out, he'll pick a fight. He always picks a fight when he's high on pot. If what Adele says here is true, that Norman Mailer did become combative, hostile, and potentially dangerous when he was high, on pot or alcohol or amphetamines, all of which he was abusing at this time, then we must consider the possibility that it's not so much that Mailer behaved that way when he was high, but that part of the reason he got high might have been to act that way and use drugs as an excuse. Around 3 a.m., Mailer, the presumptive mayoral candidate, engaged in a melodramatic exercise. He insisted that whatever guests remained at the party separate themselves into two camps. On one side of the room, the people who were for him, and on the other side, those who were against him. When the embarrassed partygoers declined to participate, Mailer physically moved people himself. None of Mailer's biographers interpret this pathetic scene for what it obviously was a sad parody of an election, a division of people into those who were pro-Norman and anti-Norman. This may have been what Mailer wanted all along with his quixotic fantasy of running for mayor. He wanted to know who was on his side and who would stick by him no matter what he did. Mailer then disappeared from the party 
and from the apartment. What happened for the next hour or so, no one can say. But by the time Mailer returned to his apartment, sometime around 4 or 4.30 a.m., he had a black eye, a bloodied face, and a torn shirt. Mailer entered the apartment kitchen, where Adele was talking with two or three remaining guests. The husband and wife exchanged words, although none of the accounts of that moment are certain as to what exactly was said. According to the various biographies, Adele may have said, you look like you've been rolled by a couple of sailors in the back streets. Or she may have said, you look like a woman with lipstick on your mouth. Or she may have said something else. Biographer Carl Rollison writes that it probably did not matter what Adele said. The point, Rollison informs us, is that Adele did not recognize or accept Mailer as her husband. Rollison also writes that the boxer Roger Donahue and his wife felt Adele had provoked Mailer with her slighting comments at the party about his masculinity. She was ridiculing him on the one subject he had no sense of humor about. It's challenging to imagine what you would have to do or say to provoke your spouse to take out a knife and stab you. Roger Donahue's remarks and Carl Rollison's reporting of those remarks sound very much like a blame-the-victim approach. Carl Rollison goes on to write, at least one mailer friend had seen Adele spend part of the evening with a girl in the bathroom looking very cozy. That girl was Adele's friend, Harriet Summers, and Adele, seeking some privacy, was in the bathroom pouring out her heart to her friend, telling her that her marriage to Norman was driving her to her wit's end. There had been rumors and suspicions, Rollison writes, about Adele's bisexuality, and there is no question that on this particular night, Mailer believed that she had betrayed him. She had been baiting him, denigrating his work, and suggesting he had been an inadequate lover. It was also true that Mailer was being unfaithful to Adele, as he had been with his first wife. Adele knew of the affair because her husband had told her about it. You're listening to the podcast A Writer's Crime, created and narrated by Tim Lemire. That's me. The musical theme of this podcast is the second movement of the Mandolin Concerto in C Major, RV 425, by Antonio Vivaldi. That piece, along with all the musical transitions in this podcast, are arranged and performed by guitarist-composer Raymond Gonzalez. You can find him online at RaymondGonzalez.net. Neither Mills nor Rollison mention an event that preceded the party, when Mailer's sister Barbara brought him some campaign materials. Dissatisfied with something, or perhaps merely out of his senses, Mailer struck his sister, in one account knocking her eyeglasses off her face, and in another account breaking them. Somehow, this was not enough of a signal to Mailer's family and friends that Mailer was not in control of himself. Denial, especially concerning someone we love or care about, someone in our own family, can be a very powerful force. When Mailer approached Adele and stabbed her with a penknife, she fell to the kitchen floor. In some accounts, Mailer tells the other guests not to help Adele and to let the bitch die. Other accounts do not mention Mailer saying such a thing. The biographical consensus is that Mailer stabbed Adele twice, once in the torso and once in the back. Very likely, Mailer approached Adele to face her, thrust the knife either into her chest or her upper abdomen, and then, 
when Adele turned or twisted her body, he stabbed her in the back. The first stab wound punctured Adele's pericardium, which is a sac that surrounds the heart. A punctured pericardium is not in itself lethal, but it is a serious wound. Had Mailer's knife blade gone further to penetrate Adele's heart, that would have opened a hole through which blood pumped into Adele's heart would have filled her pericardial sac, applying pressure on the heart and making it harder for Adele's heart to beat. Before we proceed to what happened next, let's pause and explore the issue of the knife, or what's referred to in the Mailer biographies as a pen knife. The first problem concerning the knife that Mailer used is that we can't be certain what the knife looked like. Biographers Mills and Rollison described the weapon as a two and a half inch long pen knife. Biographer Mary Dearborn refers to it simply as a two and a half inch knife. Adele, in her memoir, calls it a dirty three inch pen knife Norman had found somewhere. In Peter Manso's oral history, the writer Abraham Mickey Knox describes a scene after the stabbing in which he tried unsuccessfully to take the knife away from his friend Mailer. Knox claims that he knew Mailer had been carrying a knife on his person, but so were a lot of other people, he says. Knox calls the weapon a little penknife, with a blade that was very short. Knox goes on to remark skeptically, I didn't understand how the medical report and court testimony indicated that Adele's wound was three and a half inches deep. Finally, Biographer J. Michael Lennon writes, In point of fact, the instrument was a slender black penknife or pocket knife with a two and a half inch blade that Mailer used to clean his nails. Mills writes that when Mailer was arrested on Monday, November 21st, New York City police detective Francis Burns searched Mailer and found the penknife. One assumes that at that point, the knife was taken into police custody as evidence. Whether or not the knife was ever returned to its owner is never indicated. So, given that the biographers Mills, Rollison, and Dearborn were not acquaintances of Norman Mailer, and their books were published in 1980, 1982, and 1999, respectively, and that Peter Manso and J. Michael Lennon did not even meet Norman Mailer until 1969 and 1972, respectively. It's unclear how any of the biographers can be certain in their description of the weapon. The term penknife can be misleading. As poetically fitting as it may be for someone who pens novels to be wielding a penknife, a penknife doesn't refer exclusively to a knife the size of a ballpoint pen, or to something attached to a keychain for use in a pinch as a slotted screwdriver. That is a golf knife. Pen knives are so called because scribes once used something like them to sharpen quills. A more accurate term in Mailer's case may be foldable knife. Where and why Mailer obtained this knife is unknown. In the biographies, the weapon simply appears on cue in Mailer's possession. Biographer Carl Rollison describes the knife as one Mailer usually carried with him, without saying for how long or why. As for biographer J. Michael Lennon's assertion that Mailer used a foldable knife to clean his nails, Lennon doesn't explain why Mailer just didn't use a nail file instead. Lennon does write that in 1951, Mailer walked around New York City carrying a roll of quarters as a poor man's brass knuckles. A knife may have been added insurance, but had Mailer been mugged, the smart thing, then as now, 
would have been to hand over his wallet, not whip out a knife to deter or wage a counterattack against the mugger. A more likely explanation is that Mailer took to concealing a foldable knife on his person out of a marijuana-induced paranoia or out of a need to feel tough. Growing up in Brooklyn as a studious kid with big ears, Mailer loved reading the James T. Farrell novels featuring Studs Lonigan, an Irish-American kid in early 20th century Chicago. For Lonigan and his crew of toughs, weapons of choice to harass Jewish and black kids included brass knuckles and knives. Regardless of its source, a two-and-a-half-inch foldable knife from Mailer was a relatively safe and arguably bourgeois choice for a personal weapon. Had Mailer truly wanted to be an outlaw, he would have gotten his hands on a switchblade. But if, in 1960, the police had ever caught him with one, he would have been in Dutch. New York State banned the sale and distribution of switchblades in 1954. And with a switchblade, Mailer would hardly have been able to use the fingernail excuse. All five Mailer biographies describe the scene as Mailer coming into the apartment, Adele saying something to him, and then Mailer approaching her to stab her. In order to use a foldable knife, however, you must take it out of your pocket and with one hand hold the knife while using the other hand to unfold the blade. The time it takes to perform these steps is why some assailants prefer a switchblade, whose blade can be produced with one hand and the touch of a button. If Mailer had come into the kitchen, exchanged words with Adele, and then proceeded to take the folding knife out of his pocket, secure the blade into place, and then attack her, one imagines that would allow Adele enough time to see what her husband was doing and react appropriately. But by all accounts, Mailer surprised her by approaching her and stabbing her, which lends credence to the idea that when Mailer entered the kitchen, the knife was out and unfolded, perhaps in his pocket, perhaps out of view, but nevertheless ready to use. That would suggest forethought, that Mailer went into the kitchen with the plan to stab his wife. Ultimately, we do not know. Perhaps Mailer had the foldable knife out but concealed. Maybe Adele didn't see him take it out and unfold the blade. It also deserves to be said that there are plenty of instruments in an ordinary kitchen that you could stab someone with. You could stab someone with a butter knife or a fork. In Peter Manso's oral biography, Mailer, George Plimpton is quoted as saying that Norman Mailer attacked Adele with a kitchen knife. The Plimpton quote may be accurate, but Plimpton's facts are not. Had Mailer stabbed his wife with a kitchen knife, a steak knife, or a larger carving knife, not only would the wounds potentially be more lethal, but it would also suggest that Mailer acted with some impetuosity. That is, he came into the kitchen, saw a knife, grabbed it, and stabbed his wife in the heat of the moment. Back to the apartment and the aftermath of the stabbing. Harold Doc Humes, who started the Paris Review literary magazine, was present with his wife. Biographer Mary Dearborn describes the scene this way. Doc Humes's wife helped Adele make her way down to the Humes's apartment, Adele clearly in shock. Doc took her in, pulled a mattress from a guest room, and had her lie down on it while he called a Greenwich Village doctor he knew, Conrad Rosenberg. The Humeses managed to keep Adele very still, which was fortunate, for it turned out that one of the knife thrusts had penetrated her cardiac sac. It's important to note here that there is a difference between being shocked and medically being 
in shock. If Adele were hemorrhaging blood internally, she would have been in hemorrhagic shock. There was also no imperative to keep someone with Adele's wounds very still. That prohibition, often invoked in movies and on television, applies to victims who have had an injury to their spine, to their neck or head. That said, the people around Norman and Adele Mailer at that moment were clearly shocked by what had happened. None of them had any prior experience to deal with the situation apart from calling an ambulance or simply driving Adele to the emergency room. After the incident, Mailer refused to hand over the knife to family or friends, and there is no report that he even tried to dispose of it. Criminals, the ones who get caught anyway, are not always the smartest people on the planet, but most who commit assault with a weapon usually at least try to dispose of the weapon so that the police won't have any incriminating evidence. Mailer stabbed his wife in front of witnesses, and he didn't dispose of the weapon. That could lead one to believe that Mailer was either acting in the heat of passion, but it could also lead one to think that Mailer at that time didn't think he was committing a crime, or he wasn't fully aware of what he was doing. It's very hard to ascertain from the biographical accounts what Mailer's level of awareness was. According to biographer Lennon, Mailer was at the hospital on that Sunday explaining to the attending surgeon the nature of the incision. Well, that sounds like Mailer distancing himself from his crime by presumptuously telling the surgeon his business, as if any doctor would need Mailer's help in assessing Adele's medical situation. But it also calls the following into question. If Mailer was so besotted by alcohol and marijuana, or so blinded by rage that he had no awareness of having stabbed his wife, how could he have told the attending surgeon anything? How would he have known or remembered where the injuries to Adele's body were? closest we come to a police report of the stabbing is Peter Manso's oral biography, Mailer, His Life and Times, published in 1985. An oral biography is an organized collection of quotes with no narration or editorial comment from the editor. The section of Manso's book that addresses the stabbing comprises interviews with people who were there and people who only heard about what happened. And their accounts confirm what other Mailer biographers say, that the party was tense, unruly, a mixed bag of strangers, friends, and associates, and that Mailer was behaving erratically. Manso does include a quote from Adele. She is quoted as saying that after the couple and their children moved back to Manhattan, Mailer became a different person. Something was happening, she says, that was very, very, very wrong. But I can't talk about the thing, what happened. It's too painful. I've had to learn to let go of the past and concentrate on today. There are certain things, no matter how much therapy, that are painful, and that even with a therapist, arouse too much when you dredge them up. I can't go into it. It stirs up too much, that's all. But Adele did find a way to process the event. In our next episode, we'll explore what she has to say about the night that her husband stabbed her. You've been listening to A Writer's Crime with me, Tim Lemire. Tune in for our next episode, and thanks very much for listening.